Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm really pleasantly surprised at this big crowd. Um, two weeks back when Gail mentioned to me that we're going to have to move rooms from the 60-person amphitheater to a 100-person room, um, I kind of patted myself on the back. And I went home that evening and I looked at myself in the mirror and said, Raj, you're really popular. You know? And then last week, I met Gail here. And she told me that, uh, Raj, in case you think uh, that you're really popular, that's not the reason why so many people have signed up. It's because a lot of people are really miserable. And uh, <laughs> they want to know what the secret to happiness is. So thank you very much, all you miserable people, for showing up. Really appreciate it. I hope you continue to be miserable for a long time so that I can talk about this topic. Um, OK, so uh, as you can see, the, the title is uh, The Fundamental Happiness Paradox. Um, I'm going to uh, get to why I've titled this towards the end of this talk. Um, I'm just going to start with a little bit of background about myself. Um, uh, most of you can probably guess that I'm from India. Um, and uh, I, in fact, grew up for the first uh, 26 years of my life in India. And uh, most of you also probably know that India is a very spiritual country. It's got this kind of uh, connotation to it or, or a halo around it as a spiritual country. And uh, in my case, in my experience, it turned, turned out to be true. You know, I grew up in a family that was uh, very interested in um, issues such as enlightenment and meditation. And we would have all these kind of spiritual discussions. Uh, does God exist or not? We were not religious. You know, we were not uh, into any one particular kind of God or whatever. We were generally interested in these metaphysical questions. And uh, so uh, I guess it's not very surprising that uh, I've always been interested in this topic of happiness for, for a very, very long time, uh, for as long as I can remember, in fact. Um, and uh, going through school and college, I would uh, kind of read for fun books on philosophy and uh, you know, mysticism, and is there such a thing as enlightenment, and, and so on. Um, and so when I got the opportunity to uh, uh, get a PhD, I ended up picking a topic that was uh, related to uh, happiness. Uh, so I ended up, uh, as, as Dave mentioned, I ended up researching how moods influence how people behave. Um, so my dissertation was on how anxiety and sadness differ in terms of their influence. Um, but more recently, in the last about three or four years, I've become even more focused on this issue of happiness itself. Um, so rather than look at how moods influence how people behave, I'm looking at what can people do uh, to lead happier, more fulfilling, more meaningful lives. Um, and, and part of this transition was due to uh, a trip that I took to India in, in 2007. And uh, I'd left India for about 15 years by then. And, uh, I'd graduated from my undergraduate school uh, 20 years before then, uh, around 1989. Um, and a lot of my peers had grown up to relatively high ranks. Uh, so I had also gotten an MBA, and a lot of my MBA peers as well had become, some of them had become CEOs even. Um, and I noticed two things that are really well documented in research, uh, but many of us don't have personal experience with those two things. But I actually got to have a little bit of that personal experience. The first thing that I noticed was that uh, academic success doesn't translate into career success. Okay, so I noticed a lot of my uh, colleagues from both uh, my engineering degree, uh, undergraduate degree, and from the MBA school, um, a lot of the people who, were, who hadn't done well were, in fact, the CEOs. Okay? Likewise, there were a lot of people who were on the top of the list. Um, they were not the CEOs. Okay? Um, not to say that there was a zero correlation, but it was very mild, it seemed like. Uh, and second, more interesting thing that caught my eye was that uh, there's very little correlation between career success and what I would call, call life success. You know, how happy or fulfilled, uh, how in the moment, you know, how enjoyable uh, did these people seem to find life? Okay, uh, as a stark example, I mean, one of the CEOs uh, of one of the big companies uh, seemed extremely fragmented and miserable. You know, he couldn't stop looking at his phone. He could barely maintain a conversation. And any time you would come back into the conversation, you would throw in stuff like, oh, last time I was in Italy, and the other time when I was in a you know, safari in Africa, and all that. It seemed like he was name dropping and trying to impress people. Um, in contrast, uh, there was another guy who had kind of fallen out of the rat race, so to speak, who was uh, into social work. And he seemed extremely happy. Okay? He seemed extremely in the moment. He was happy to hang out till 3 AM and, and get drunk. Okay, uh, which is what I was in the mood for, you know. Um, and so uh, it kind of caught my eye 
And when I came back to the university, I uh, wanted to kind of think about this question a little bit more because I teach at the McComb School of Business, and I was thinking, okay, everything that we teach them uh, is going to make them better at um, moving their company, the, the company they work for forward, increasing brand share, maximizing profit, et cetera. But if it is not going to ultimately result in them feeling better about their own lives, in some sense, are we not serving them, right? What, what are we in the business of, you know, in educating people? So to me, it seems like a fundamental purpose ought to be that uh, we give them the tools uh, to lead a fulfilling and meaningful life, but we don't ever talk about that in the classroom, right? I mean, usually it's relegated to, I say relegated, maybe delegated is a better word, but to, um, you know, the spiritual gurus or, you know, pastors, uh, sometimes religious fundamentalists, but most often um, you have conversations about these topics uh, with your family, with your friends, uh, usually, again, at 3 a.m. when you're drunk and sometimes stoned, whatever, right? So uh, I wanted to offer an opportunity to the MBAs um, to talk about this important question uh, in the classroom. So I offer a course called Creativity and Leadership. Um, I'll be teaching it for the fifth time in um, the spring of 2013, which is coming up. So any MBAs out here, you know, feel free to email me about the course. I'd be happy to send you syllabi and other information. I'd be happy to chat with you about it, et cetera. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is a kind of a subset of what it is that I talk about in that class. Now, before I even you know, say anything else, I ought to say this, I think, up front, is that I'm, I'm, I've not arrived, okay? I'm not some kind of enlightened guru or whatever. I'm just intensely interested in this topic. Uh, I've always been interested in it. I see myself as a conduit, as uh, somebody who uh, is a, I don't, want to use the, I don't want to use the word messenger because it has some connotations to it, but uh, just somebody who's extremely interested in the topic and happens to be knowledgeable about it. And there might be other people out here, Robert comes to mind as one example, who might be even more knowledgeable. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to have so many people interested in the topic. I just want to discuss it. I could go on and on on this topic for the rest of my life, it seems like, okay? So it's my passion, it's my calling, okay? That's about it. The second thing I want to mention is that um, everything I say uh, need not be uh, things that strike you as being true or acceptable to you, that's fine. Uh, I'm happy to revise my opinion on many of these things. It seems to me, uh, based off of my thinking, based off of the research that I'm familiar with, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about ought to be true, uh, but it's possible that doesn't apply to everybody under all circumstances, okay? One last thing, I, I think I'm going to uh, go on for about an hour from now. Um, and so that'll leave us with about 20, 25 minutes for Q&A. Um, but if I finish up early, great. If I finish up a little late, that's fine too. But so I'd appreciate it if you could hold off your questions till the end. Um, and, but if you want to ask me any clarification questions while I'm going on, just to understand something, that's fine, okay? Okay, so um, I have a website called uh, happysmarts.com. And uh, so the reason I named this uh, Happy Smarts is because I think there are three kinds of smarts out there. One is academic smarts. So people with great academic smarts are, have high IQ, very good at debating, very good at taking tests. They end up as the toppers in, in your classroom, okay? Then there's career smarts. People with career smarts have social intelligence, um, communication intelligence, um, emotional intelligence. They tend to be the CEOs, okay? And then there's happy smarts, okay? I think kids have a lot of happy smarts, okay? Kids gravitate towards things. They have an antenna out for what's most enjoyable. One moment they're fighting with somebody else because they want a toy. The next moment they don't have any egos, no grudges. They're playing with them because you know, that's what is gonna make them happy at that point, okay? And uh, my broad thesis is that as we grow older, we lose touch with happy smarts. Um, and part of the reason is because the career smarts, developing career smarts and academic smarts um, kind of blinds us to things that we already knew. And so a lot of the gravitation towards happy smarts involves unlearning rather than um, learning something new. Okay, although there is a little bit of learning new things too, I think. Anyway, so I have a bunch of uh, little pamphlets out here. Uh, uh, these are kind of forms on which you can provide your email and names to me if you're interested in keeping track of uh, what is happening uh, uh, with my book. I'm writing a book called If You're So Smart, How Come You're Not Happy, um, which is the same title as this talk. Uh, I might revise the title of the book, I, I'm not sure, but. Um, if you're interested, I'm, I'm just going to pass this around. Um, obviously, you're not obliged to fill it out, but if you're interested at all, you can fill it out and you can always unsubscribe to it later on uh, if you don't like what I have to say or just too busy with other things, etc.
Okay, so <clears throat> uh, returning to the topic of happiness, I mean, uh, it seems like everybody acknowledges that happiness is very, very important. Okay, um, lots and lots of books out there about the topic um, from Aristotle's time. Uh, people have thought happiness is very important. Uh, it turns out that it's uh, in fact true, you know, so it could be the case that People think, you know, these philosophers and psychologists think happiness is important, but the people, uh, the, the lay people don't really think of it as being important. But it turns out from my studies, uh, and I'm going to show you some evidence from other studies too, um, very quickly, uh, happiness is in fact very important. So if I ask people um, to rank different goals, and these are all goals that are very important because I've done focus groups with people in interviews and uh, found out, you know, what goals are very important. Things like maintaining healthy relationships, being physically healthy, having a successful career, and so on, making a lot of money. Happiness always emerges as one of the top goals, okay? Um, in, in one of these studies, uh, surveys we did, uh, it came kind of second to, but statistically non-significantly different from um, maintaining healthy relationships or good family life, okay? Um, so as I mentioned right at the bottom of that screen, um, there's studies which have been done with uh, 10,000 people surveys. Okay, happiness emerges as the most important goal. Um, but yet, it turns out, and m most of you took the Gini survey, right? Is there anybody who did not take the survey that was sent out? Okay, uh, some of you did not. Okay, so I sent out a survey through Gale to you guys, and uh, one of the questions on the survey was what I call the Gini question. And the Gini question goes like this, right? Um, you know Aladdin's Gini. Let's say that the Gini approaches you or, or you know, appears in front of you and, and gives you three wishes, grants you three wishes. What three wishes would you make, right? Uh, if happiness is, in fact, a very, very important goal, you would think that, of course, people should wish for happiness. You know, why not, right? I mean, the genie is giving you everything and anything. It's all-powerful, all-knowing, okay? And in some of these surveys, they also add that it's benign. Assume that the genie is benign, right? Turns out a lot of people don't think that it's benign, as you'll see in a little bit. Okay, uh, but it turns out most people do not ask for happiness. Instead, um, in surveys that I've done outside uh, of the school, outside of this audience, um, material things like money, you know, a big house, a great swimming pool, you know, a beautiful car, vacationing in, you know, exotic places, etc., is by far the most popular wish that people make. You know, I would like even more money. And it's consistent with a lot of surveys that have been done uh, in which people are asked, what's the one thing that could make you happier? People say money. 60% of the people say money. In this uh, crowd, you guys are all more, I guess, advanced or evolved or whatever, right? <laughs> um, uh, not so many people ask for money. Uh, in fact, a lot of you, I was kind of pleasantly surprised to see that uh, personal growth emerged as being one of the most, um, uh, the second most uh, desired kind of wish uh, out there. And, and world peace, right? I mean, really evolved crowd. So, um, but, but in, the, in the real world out there, it turns out that world peace is, is very low. Um, but what is kind of surprising is uh, that happiness ranks so low, right? Even with this crowd, uh, and you all knew that the topic was happiness today, and therefore there's a little bit of self-selection going on, right? Maybe even a little bit of priming, right? I mean, you guys have already been alerted to the idea that maybe I can ask for happiness. Uh, but the, it clearly is not one of the top goals, right? Top wishes. Why is it? Okay, I think there's a little bit of a disconnect between what people say is important and what is revealed uh, in terms of their wishes. And this is related to the uh, fundamental happiness paradox, uh, and I'm going to talk about it, like I said, towards the end of this talk. Uh, let me just first point this out, that asking the genie for happiness is a smart thing. Okay, if you truly want to be happy, um, a lot of research has shown that you need to have clarity on what your goal is if you are to achieve that goal. It makes sense, right? which is why a lot of times these sports psychologists ask uh, sports athletes to visualize what it is that they want. And if you don't know where you're going, how are you going to get there, right? So it's very intuitive. Uh, but having just that clarity alone is not enough. It's also very important to um, be willing to make trade-offs um, that give that goal a higher priority, right? So if it comes between choosing between, let's say, happiness and your ego or happiness and money, you know, you're better off making trade-offs that um, enhance your chances of achieving your goal of happiness. Okay, um, and uh, so it, it makes sense. So, you know, athletes know that uh, if they want to win an Olympic medal, they're going to have to make trade-offs, wake up at four in the morning or five in the morning and exercise, you know, eat healthily, not party too much and so on. Students know what it takes to earn grades and they're willing to make those trade-offs if they want those high grades, etc. Why should happiness be any different, right? 
But it turns out with happiness, somehow, we all think that we can just lead life business as usual, and somehow, magically, happiness is going to fall into our lap. Okay? Um, and I'm going to uh, tell you that that's not true. Okay, so getting back to the genie question. So I didn't leave it at that. Um, so I've surveyed maybe close to 1,000 people now with the genie question, and I've interviewed maybe about 100 people, uh, maybe 200 actually, across the four classes that I've taught, and some other people outside of it. Why don't you ask the genie for happiness, right? You say happiness is very important. Yes, people agree. Uh, why don't you ask the genie for happiness, okay? Uh, there are 12 different reasons, and you probably can't read all of them from where you're sitting, but don't, uh, don't fret. I'm going to get through each of these reasons one at a time. Um, and uh, really quickly, among the people who took this survey out here, if you did not ask for happiness, why, what are some of the reasons why you, did, you guys did not ask? Yes? OK. OK. So happiness is the kind of end in some ways. And these other things you ask for lead you to happiness. OK. So I have an analogy here, right? Let's say that American Airlines gives you a coupon. OK. You can fly free anywhere you want to go. And you really want to get to New York. But you know it flies via Philadelphia, right? Would you ask for a ticket to Philadelphia because it happens to fall on the way? Or would you rather happen, uh, ask for a ticket for New York? Right? Why ask for an intermediary goal when the, the, the end goal is one of happiness? Right? OK. So any other, um, any other uh, reasons why you did not ask for happiness? Especially if it's not covered out there. Yes? Okay. Okay. Uh, I think I'm going to cover that in one or more of the reasons. It's one of those that kind of seems to tap into more than one reason that I've listed out here. Okay. Good. Okay. Let me let me just continue on. Uh, let me talk about each of these uh, twelve reasons. And and don't be scared that there are all these twelve reasons. You know, it, it'll go really quickly. You'll see. So the the first reason is um, some of the people think that happiness does not come to those who chase it, right? So I don't want to ask for happiness because once I get desperate for happiness, then it won't come to me, you know? So it's similar to a butterfly, kind of chasing a butterfly. The butterfly doesn't come to you. There's even a quote like that by somebody. You know, happiness is like a butterfly. It kind of chooses to sit on you, but you can't really chase it. Okay, and it's partly true. It turns out that there have been studies that have been done where people have been asked explicitly to try and maximize happiness as they're listening to songs, okay? And those who were asked to maximize happiness ended up being less happy than those who were just told to listen to songs. Okay? Why is it? So what happens when you make happiness an explicit goal and you chase it? Um, you tend to monitor where you are to where you want to be. Okay? Uh, it turns out that for every goal that we adopt, a monitoring system kind of automatically kicks in. And one of the cutest examples of this is if I ask you to not think of a white bear, right? ask you to not think of a white bear. You know, whatever you think of, don't think of a white bear. It turns out it, we find it very difficult to not think of a white bear, right? Why? Because our goal is to not think of a white bear. And how do we know if you're achieving that goal? By monitoring where we are um, compared to where we want to be. And where we want to be is not to think of a white bear. And, and the only way we'll know we're we are there of not thinking of a white bear is, is by thinking of the white bear first so that we can't think of it, et cetera, okay? So uh, with happiness, what happens is it's a byproduct of this discrepancy between where you are and where you want to be. If you have a goal and you achieve it, then you feel happy. If you're far away from it, far from achieving it, then you're unhappy. And if happiness itself is the goal, and usually we set up a high level of happiness in order to um, feel that we are, we are where we want to be, uh, then by definition, you're not going to be as happy as you want to be, okay? And that is going, then going to erode into your happiness. Okay, but this is important, I think. It might, might seem like a subtle difference. I, to me, it's not very subtle. Uh, there's an important difference between chasing something and being desperate for it, being feverish, and making it a priority. Okay? Um, there's many other goals like happiness that when you chase them, uh, it turns out you don't achieve them, like sleep. Right? Trying to desperately fall asleep, again, I mean, you're monitoring where you are to where you want to be. And where you want to be is asleep. And when you're asleep, you can't monitor anymore, right? The fact that you're monitoring means that you're not asleep. And then you get desperate to sleep and so on, right? So it becomes a kind of a vicious cycle. Um, 
uh, wooing somebody that you're really interested in, right? So my wife is here, so I know this from personal experience that, you know, trying to desperately chase her uh, was not productive. So I had to kind of ease, <laughs> ease off a little bit. Um, so uh, health, right? I mean, worrying too much about being healthy, being a hypochondriac is not conducive to being healthy. But at the same time, you can do things, put things in place in your life so that you make it more likely that you achieve that goal. So taking a warm bath or not even eating a heavy meal, uh, making sure you don't look at the emails after 9 p.m., et cetera, are good things you can do in order to fall asleep, right? So prioritizing is different from chasing something. Okay, reasons two and three. Um, they, they kind of go together. Um, and I think that the gentleman there, he mentioned uh, uh, a reason which I think kind of taps into this a little bit. Um, people think that happiness is too abstract. You know, what exactly would I get in return if I asked the genie for happiness? You know, I'm not even sure. Would I be peaceful? Would I be ecstatic? Would I be in love? You know, and it turns out the dictionary definition um, doesn't help. You know, it's, it's very loose. It's an umbrella term that people use to uh, fit in any positive emotion uh, that they want, okay? Uh, and, a, and a related uh, idea is that happiness is too shallow. People think that if I ask the genie for happiness, I'm going to end up um, like this kind of drugged out guy saying, hey, make peace, not war, you know, or, or something like that. You know, one of those Berkeley uh, kind of people. Uh, and, and a lot of people are, are afraid of turning into somebody like that. You know, they want to be kind of uh, in control and uh, normal and, and doing things that make them look normal to other people and so on. Um, and they're afraid that uh, that might not be the case if they ask for happiness, okay? But the, again here, the, the interesting thing is, uh, even though people are, find it difficult to come up with a definition of happiness that's concrete and, and not very shallow, uh, if you in fact ask people, um, as I've done, to tell me about an event that happened in their life that made them happy, okay? And I content analyze what it is that they say, it turns out that people do have pretty specific and concrete definitions of happiness. And not just that, some of these definitions are not at all shallow. Okay, I'm gonna share with you a couple of definitions that have turned out uh, from the um, surveys that I've done. Okay, so happiness with a small h, I call it with a small h. Um, this is an example of a very concrete emotion um, that's not very uh, deep, that's, that's in fact somewhat shallow, okay? Um, so this is uh, the positivity that results from a lot of achievements. Um, it's a sense of pride, okay? Um, of feeling a sense of superiority over other people. So there's two kinds of pride that can happen. Interpersonal pride, you feel you're better, better than other people, superior to other people, and intrapersonal pride, you've come a long way from where you were before, okay? And interpersonal pride, I think, is a little more shallow. And I don't mean this in a sense that it's, it's a emotion that is cheap or whatever. I just mean it in the sense that it's not sustainable. In that sense, it's shallow. Um, and I'll tell you why it's not sustainable in a little bit. Um, so uh, it's a feeling that I'm special, single, gifted out, uh, singled out, gifted. Um, and uh, so to, to a lot of people doing research in emotions, um, this is very similar to or identical to pride, actually. Then there's another kind of happiness, the happiness of the big age, um, which results from sensing that uh, you're undivided, unfragmented, in harmony. So in other words, life as it is, is perfect with its imperfections, okay? Uh, now, uh, among the respondents, uh, the older respondents tend to uh, be the ones who come up with the second definition, okay? A lot of the younger people are not familiar with this, with this happiness of the big age, although when I talk to them about it, they seem like, uh, to kind of be able to relate it to, to some extent. So they've had some experience with it, with it but not a lot, okay? Uh, then there's a bunch of people who come up with love, um, what I would call love. So the idea is uh, that they say that they experienced it when they went home for Thanksgiving or they acquired a new boyfriend or a girlfriend or whatever, you know, or, or a new pet, et cetera. Okay, and these are very specific, right? I mean, these are not at all abstract. They're concrete. Uh, and some of them, love and um, what, what is called elevation or fulfillment, uh, are in fact also quite deep, okay? They're not shallow. So why not ask for these kinds of uh, happiness from the genie, right? If you think that asking for happiness is shallow. Okay, so let me go to reason number four, which is that happiness is fleeting and ephemeral. So if I ask for it, then it won't last. So why ask for something that I know cannot last forever by definition? Right? And the idea is that, uh, and it seems pretty intuitive, that happiness or emotions 
are kind of like night and day. You know, you need the night, you need a lack of light, you need darkness in order to appreciate light, right? You need to know what is small in order to know what's big, right? How many of you guys subscribe to this idea that um, happiness ought to be fleeting because you can't experience happiness without experiencing sadness? Yeah, so it is a very popular um, uh, belief. Um, and I, I think that it's, um, it's possible that in reality, it's going to be very difficult to sustain a state of positivity forever, okay? But I think that it is possible, theoretically possible. And uh, subscribing to the idea that um, you can't have one without the other, in fact, undermines your ability to be, uh, to be able to sustain happiness. Okay, let me just give you a few examples by way of convincing you. First of all, um, kids can be happy for long, right? If it's true that you need sadness in order to be happy, how come kids can be happy for such a long time, right? There's been studies done with kids, and it turns out that they go through four states, okay? Uh, sleeping, um, eating, um, exploring the environment, okay, and pooping. Okay, pooping I just add as a fourth one, okay? Uh, it's not really, it doesn't take a long time, but anyway, so, um, it turns out across those activities, um, kids go through either energy acquisition or energy expenditure. Okay, so when they're eating, when they're sleeping, etc., they're either replenishing energy or they're maintaining it. And the process of replenishing and maintaining energy um, is correlated with an emotional state of peace or calmness. And exploring, expending energy is associated with a sense of exuberance and stimulation. So theoretically, it's possible if kids get everything that they want at every moment in time, then they'll oscillate or go through transitions between high arousal energy states, so stimulating energy states, um, and low arousal energy states, but they don't have to venture into the negative territory ever, okay? And it's true that for a lot of kids who are well taken care of, who are well nurtured, who get everything that they need at that point in time, it turns out that they can actually go through long periods of time and they're happy. And it turns out, in fact, when surveys done with people across the world, with over 40,000 people, there's a researcher out here called Sam Gosling who's done some of this work, um, the happiest moments in our lives are when we are around eight years old, okay? Before that, I think it's difficult to kind of elicit responses from kids because they don't know what happiness is or before they can, you know, answer the question they've run away or something, okay? But uh, we, so we start out being really happy when you're about eight years old and we're really miserable when you're around 15, 16 years old, right around when puberty hits, right? Especially women, it turns out. Okay, and after that, we kind of like crawl our way up, okay, a little bit, and then a midlife crisis hits right around 46, okay, which is where I am, which is why I'm so miserable, okay? And then you go back to being happier as you're older. Uh, when you hit Vijay's age, then you're really happy, okay, which is why he's so happy out there. Um, and uh, part of the reason why that happens is at that point, you're uh, no longer willing to put up with bullshit, right? You're saying, okay, I know what makes me happy. I don't want to hang out with people that make me unhappy. I don't want negative forces in my life. I'm going to gravitate towards positive things. You have the clarity, okay? So you go back to being a child, in a, in a sense, okay? But the, the point is that you can, in fact, sustain uh, long periods of happiness, okay? And it's not true that you need one in order to experience the other. You would have to oscillate between high arousal or high energy positive states and low energy positive states, but you don't have to venture that much into the negative territory, okay? Um, I, I can uh, also kind of um, can ask you this question, which to a lot of people uh, convinces them uh, to some extent that happiness in fact can last long, by asking you the reverse question, can depression last forever, right? And it turns out a lot of people think, yeah, yeah I know somebody like that, you know, who's always depressed, right? If depression can last forever, then why can't happiness, right? It's just the opposite. Um, I think, and this is why uh, some time back I said that happiness with the small edge is shallow, and happiness with the big H is uh, deeper. Uh, happiness with the small H, uh, by definition, is going to be fleeting because your happiness depend, depends on external stimuli, on external circumstances. It depends on uh, how much you've achieved or how much other people think you've achieved. It depends on your wealth. It depends on um, relative comparisons to other people, which is always going to fluctuate and, and be in a flux. Okay, there's always going to be somebody who's going to come up who's superior to you at some point, physically, intellectually, beauty-wise. Etc. So if you um, tether your happiness to comparisons to other people, then you're setting yourself up for this kind of volatile roller coaster ride. Okay? But if it's an internal state, uh, it depends on your attitude, you're comfortable with whatever it is that's around you, and you take it as things that make life interesting, as a challenge. Life is perfect with its imperfections. I'm completely taken care of. 
Um, now, it's difficult to adopt that attitude, and there's some obstacles to adopting that attitude. But if you can even relate to it a little bit, then you understand that that's a much more sustainable state to be in. OK? <clears throat> it's similar to how we don't adapt to good views or to um, friendships. In fact, they get better with time, a lot of time. Um, so happiness with the big H is like that. OK, reason number five. Um, this is related to the idea that happiness is shallow, uh, but in a relative sense, a lot of people think that other goals like pursuit of truth, you know, with a capital T, um, I know what reality, re I, I want to know what reality is, is there a God, etc. that's much more important to me. Um, being one with God, you know, a lot of religious people feel that that's much more important. So I have a kind of a two-part um, response to this. Can any goal really be much more important or more important than happiness? Okay. So in other words, uh, from a purely philosophical or lo logical standpoint, is there any act that is, quote unquote, selfless, right? So think about a mom that jumps into a, you know, a burning building to retrieve a child. You know, she's doing it, you could argue, because she would rather do it and risk her life than live with the knowledge that she never attempted to save her child. So um, she's happier doing it and risking her life than uh, not risking her life. So even this, quote unquote, purely selfless altruistic act, in, in a sense, can be logically um, thought of as, as being not so selfless. It is, you're trying to adhere to a certain value or a vision that you have of yourself. So in that sense, it is serving a purpose. That's, it's making you happy in that sense, okay? But keeping logic aside, um, there's a bunch of studies that I want to talk about now really uh, quickly uh, that seem to show that happiness is in fact uh, a very, very important goal for us, if not the most important goal. Um, and everything else is subsumed under it. So uh, in one set of studies, uh, people were asked to um, uh, recollect whatever they, they could about a very uh, old past event, right? And it turns out that uh, people remember how they felt about certain things, about products, about events, about people, um, but they may have lost uh, memory for the details of the event. So, you know, very rarely will you, will you say that, you know, I really remember what Sarah was wearing and the color of her hair and everything, but I can't really kind of, you know, remember how I felt about her. Right? In fact, it would, rather, it would mostly be the opposite, that you know exactly how you felt about people or about movies or about books or about places, you might forget the details, okay? Um, the second, I think this is even more impressive, is that uh, there's uh, a colleague of mine at Columbia who interviewed a lot of people uh, who were in their quote-unquote winter years, right? I mean, they were close to dying, 80 years or more, um, et cetera, and he asked them, if there's one thing that you would do to change your life, if you could relive your life, how would it be different, right? And um, many people said that I wouldn't change anything, right? I mean, that seems like uh, one of the responses that a lot of people uh, give because, you know, they've come to a point where they understand, you know, they went through a lot of ups and downs, they've, they're at peace with it, right? They're at peace with their lives. But if there's one thing they would change, the most popular response was that I'd be less stuck up, I'd be less aggressive, and I'd be much more um, focused on having a good time and taking simple pleasures of life, okay? In other words, I lead a happier life, okay? I wasn't as focused on what it is that ultimately truly mattered, which is to make people ha around me happy and be happy myself, okay? I was too kind of caught up in the rat race, okay? Finally, uh, this is uh, uh, one of my favorite set of studies that looked at Alzheimer patients. Um, so Alzheimer's uh, patients, uh, you, you, some of you may know somebody uh, who suffers from it personally, uh, they have short-term memory loss, right? So you might visit them and 10 minutes later, uh, they've forgotten that you visited them, right? You leave your car keys in their house, you go knocking on the door and then they open the door and say, hey, when did you come, Raj, right? So, um, and you've just left their house, right? So um, it turns out that a lot of people feel very frustrated when they have to deal with Alzheimer's patients because, um, you know, they feel that the time they spend with these people is a waste because they don't remember you, right? They don't remember that you visited, et cetera. So some of these Alzheimer's patients were put under the um, fMRI machine, which uh, measures the uh, brain activities, and certain parts of the brain light up when you're feeling happy. And it turns out that a full three hours after somebody that they like has visited them, um, the brain is still kind of firing, right? So they're still happy after three hours, okay? Uh, so this is the excuse that my wife and I use to take our kids on holidays. You know, we all know that, both of us know that they're not gonna remember anything, right? but we think that we are kind of having a good impact on them by making their brains fire. Um, 
So I think we're setting up a good platform for them to be good citizens, et cetera. Um, okay. <clears throat> Reason number six. Uh, a lot of people feel that they would become selfish if the genie uh, were to grant them happiness. Okay, so the idea is that if I'm already happy, then why should I do anything for other people, right? Why should I care about other people? I'm already as happy as I want to be, right? So happiness is going to make me selfish. Okay, but in fact, it turns out uh, the research and emotion shows that it's exactly the opposite, especially with this emotion that I talked about some time back that I call fulfillment, okay? Uh, some people refer to as elevation as, as the term that's used. Um, with elevation or fulfillment, it promotes altruism, okay? The idea is, I mean, it's almost like a, the analogy is to think of a bucket. So if your bucket is empty, if your emotional bucket is empty, you're feeling insecure or afraid or anxious or stressed, then you want other people to pour into the bucket, right? You want to take care of your own emotional needs first before you're willing to look to other people and serve them. But if your bucket is overflowing with joy, then it's almost natural for you to then look to other people and uh, figure out ways in which you want to serve them, okay? And you can think back on your own life, right? I mean, when are you more likely to be uh, playful with your kids? Uh, when you're stressed out, when people have been shouting at you at the office, or when things have been going well in your life, right? Um, so it turns out that this intuition is wrong. Uh, in fact, the opposite is true, that you're more likely to be altruistic when you're feeling happy. Okay, so we get into some of the more, I think, interesting reasons here. Um, I'm already as happy as I want to be, right? First of all, I think that if somebody is in that state, then they probably wouldn't be wishing for anything more, right? So you would probably say, I give away my wishes to other people because I'm already there, right? But the people who say this do make for some wishes, right? So they're not quite as happy as they want to be, it seems like, okay? But um, I, I want to mention here something that, you know, if some of you are in this position, very happy for you, I think we need more people like you. Um, it would be great to have a world in which everybody's happy. I think that that would just like boost up everybody's happiness to such an extent that we'd burst through the stratosphere of happiness and you know, reach the moon or whatever. But um, I do want to uh, point out that it's possible that for some of us who claim this, there's a little bit of a delusion going on, okay? And uh, we know that the human capacity for being deluded is infinite, almost, you know? There's been so many studies on this, on cheating, for example. Everybody thinks everybody else cheats, uh, but they don't themselves, et cetera, um, that there's a lot of delusion going on, okay? And the delusion uh, with respect to happiness has some strategic element to it, which makes me feel that people, either consciously or non-consciously, might claim to be more happy than they actually are, okay? Uh, one of the things that's been found, for example, is that um, happy people attract other people, okay? Happy people are popular, right? Uh, who would you rather go to? Somebody who's miserable or somebody who's happy, everybody goes towards the happy people, right? They make other people happy, so everybody wants to be happy, and so you go towards people who are happy rather than towards people who are miserable. And to the extent that people recognize it, there is a strategic element, there's a value to be derived from proclaiming to be happy, okay? Um, the second thing that can happen is uh, when you say you're happy, when you tell yourself you're happy or tell other people you're happy, you do get a boost in happiness, okay? So there's this second kind of strategic element to it. Um, so in that sense, it, can, it could also uh, almost be a self-fulfilling prophecy. To claim you're happy is the same as being happy, okay? But uh, it turns out it's not that simple either, right? In the sense that uh, you can't lead a sustainably happy life by just telling yourself you're happy, okay? You need to put things in place, you need to feel good from the inside, uh, for you to be happy in the long term. So to, to some extent, at the margin, it can help you uh, be a little happier, right? Just before you make a presentation, you can kind of look at yourself in the mirror and say you're popular, and that might help you, but it won't help you in the long run, okay? Um, the other thing I, I do want to mention here too is that uh, those who think of yourself as being happy, um, maybe you haven't thought about this, these subtle differences in the kinds of happiness. Okay, which kind of happy are you? Okay, maybe what you're really saying is I'm con content. I'm content with the uh, material positions I have. I don't need any more. Uh, there's lots of other poor people in this world, and I'd rather that all my, you know, the extra wealth goes to them. Um, but that's not the same as uh, being happy with a big age. Okay, so in, in a sense, I mean, there's another place to aspire to be, uh, which is, is better in, in many ways. It's more um, uh, the feeling that, that can be sustained. Uh, it also results in selflessness, uh, results in greater creativity, I'm gonna talk a little bit about it, and has some other positive effects associated with it. Um, reason number eight, okay, so I don't wanna be happy all the time, 
uh, I sometimes want to feel negative emotions. Okay, so therefore I want to ask the genie for happiness. Okay, um, now it turns out, and these are informal surveys that I've done with a lot of people, um, is whenever they're happy, I approach them and say, you're feeling really happy, aren't you? And they say, yes, I am. So would you rather not feel happy right now? Because it kind of gets boring, right? I've never heard anybody say, no, 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 I don't want any happiness anymore, okay? I've approached people who are feeling miserable, and I've asked them, uh, is it okay for the misery to continue? I've never heard anybody say, it's okay. Everybody wants to be happier if they're feeling miserable. Nobody wants the emotion of happiness to end, okay? But when we're asked this question, we come up with this reason that, you know, being happy all the time is boring, okay? Um, happiness is, by definition, the state you want to be in. Okay? Happiness is the state you want to be in. Therefore, it can never get boring. Okay? Um, there have been studies which have been done with rats. You guys probably know of some of these studies in the 50s and 60s. Um, the rats were, um, they, there was an electrode that went into their brain that stimulated part of the brain called the pleasure point um, that they could stimulate at will by just pressing on a lever and that would make them feel happy. And these rats ended up starving themselves to death because they kept pressing the lever all the time. They forgot to have food, they forgot to have sleep, they forgot to have sex, okay, they just starved to death, okay? Now, with human beings, I think uh, we, we don't have that danger, I believe. Now, the experiment hasn't been done with humans, um, but if it were to be done, I imagine that we wouldn't be that stupid um, because we can forecast. We have the ability to imagine futures, uh, rats don't, okay? So we know that we are probably gonna starve to death if we don't eat. Okay, so we would uh, definitely do that, but the point is that there is some evidence showing that happiness isn't a boring state, okay? Um, it also turns out happiness uh, will not reduce your creativity. There is this myth, um, so Paul here was asking me if I was gonna mention Sheiks and Mihai. Uh, so there's a, a researcher called Mihai Sheiks and Mihai who's done a lot of work on flow and creativity. And what he finds is there is a myth of the suffering creative person, okay? And a lot of uh, examples that stand out uh, like, you know, Salvador Dali or Dostoevsky, uh, people who led miserable lives uh, that happen to be creative, I think, um, stand out as examples of how you need to be miserable in order to be creative, okay? But really, I mean, creativity is orthogonal to misery. Uh, if you look at a two-by-two two kind of cell, four-cell design, you know, miserable, not miserable, creative, not creative, uh, there's a lot of people who are neither miserable nor creative, okay? But there's people filling up all the other three cells as well. There's lots of people, in fact, um, in studies that have been done on a remote associations test and so on, it turns out that when you're feeling calm, when you're feeling happy and peaceful is when you're likely to be creative, okay? Not when you're feeling miserable and stressed out. Okay, so it's a myth. Um, a constantly happy life is meaningless. Um, uh, a lot of people think that, and uh, I, that kind of leads me to uh, another reason that I want to talk about in a little bit um, as, as reason number uh, 11. So let me just postpone that. Um, reason number nine, I don't deserve to be happy, okay? So uh, a lot of people who mention this, I think, have a, a, a noble disposition. Um, they're the kind of people who are content with everything that they have. I talked about it some time back. They're happy with the wealth that they have, the achievements that they have. Uh, they think that they're blessed, okay? Uh, but they also feel that a lot of other people are not, okay? People in Iraq and Afghanistan and India, they're all suffering. So people feel that, you know, let the happiness go to them. You know, I, I don't want happiness, I don't deserve to be happy. I have everything going for me. It's almost like I'm being too greedy by also asking for happiness, okay? Um, what I think these people are saying, in fact, is that I have more of these extrinsic rewards, um, these kind of conventional yardsticks of success, um, and I don't want any more of those, okay? And if they were to think a little more deeply about this topic, uh, I think they would come to the conclusion that not, it's not just that they deserve to be happy, I think they're obliged to be happy, okay? And, and that's very important to note. They don't just deserve to be happy, they're obliged to be happy, because if they weren't happy with everything that they have, who else could be happy, right? And if you especially note this fact that happiness leads to many positive effects, okay, you're less selfish. You're less selfish when you're happy. It's only when you're not happy um, that you become more selfish, okay? When you're happy, you're spreading your happiness to other people, you're being selfless. So for the sake of others, even if you think that you don't deserve to be happy, I think you ought to be happy, okay? Uh, and 
the people who belong to this category, who are at the peak of success, the top 2% of the world in terms of wealth and so on, we need to set the example to other people that life can be simpler, life can be more beautiful, life can be more cooperative, more harmonious. Okay, we need to be the people who take it upon ourselves to tell the rest of the world to lead a happier life. Okay, so I, I think I would urge you to get out of this uh, I don't deserve to be happy uh, kind of a mindset uh, if, if that's one of the reasons why you did not ask for happiness. Okay, so happiness should be earned and not received. Um, I want to be happy for the right reasons, okay? Now, the people who say this have uh, the idea that fake happiness is not good. Now, I want real, authentic happiness, right? Um, but they're okay with fake money, right? They're okay in not really earning the money, you know, genie granting them money. They're even okay with fake relationships. You know, they don't really have to, I mean, they're okay with not working hard towards building a great relationship. The genie grants them, from now on, you get along fabulously well with your wife. Yeah, I'll take that, right? But somehow with happiness, they draw the line, right? Ah, uh, fake happiness, no, okay? Um, so one of the experiments that, that's often kind of uh, mentioned in this context is uh, there's a typo that it, it should be nausic. Uh, Nozick's th thought experiment uh, goes something like this, right? Imagine that your brain is hooked up to, to a computer, right? And the computer program kind of generates events that you now imagine, okay? And, and it's so good that it's actually like real life, right? So you can't really tell if it's real life or fake life. It's that good, okay? Um, and when you connect it to this, this program, a fabulous set of events happen, right? Um, you're successful and you know you have a beautiful house, a lovely wife or husband, great kids, you know, and, and you get all kinds of awards, um, go on great vacations, eat great food, you know, if you've seen The Matrix, right? It's, it's kind of like that, okay? Now the question is, how many of you guys would be willing to um, get attached to this or plugged into this? And I asked this as one of the survey questions, I know that some of you guys didn't take it, um, and your response is 70% said no. I don't want to be plugged into this machine. I'd rather experience authentic misery than fake happiness, right? <laughs> okay. Um, now, that experiment and the results from it have been taken to conclude that people want real happiness. They don't want fake happiness, okay? Um, but I think there's more to the story. I think the thought experiment is flawed in, in some ways. One of the ways in which it is flawed is that people can't relate to um, how it, life would be if they were in fact plugged into the machine. And so it's very difficult for them to uh, put themselves and empathize with the situation of being plugged into the machine. And so asking them to kind of uh, indulge in this highly difficult task is, is very tough, okay? As a simple example, you know, uh, uh, women who get pregnant and deliver a child, you know, when they're delivering the child, it turns out that 70 to 80 percent say, never again, right? <laughs> Especially if they're not on epidurals, okay? They say never again, but uh, after a few weeks or a month, few months pass, they're ready to have another child again, right? So you can't empathize with how you're feeling when you're undergoing a certain level of intense pain or pleasure, okay? It's called the cold to hot empathy gap, okay? Another example of the empathy gap is that I've sometimes endured. Uh, when I'm in the throes of a really bad hangover, I say, never drinking again, never, you know? And it turns out that that's not true, right? <laughs> Okay, so that's, that's one of the problems with the thought experiment, okay? Uh, but, so I've done another thought experiment, what I call the anti-Novic thought, uh, Nozick thought experiment, uh, what I call anti, or A-N-T-E, anti-Nozick thought experiment. Uh, Kavya here, who's sitting here, has helped me run some of those studies. Um, so in that, you know, that's the third question that you were asked, uh, which is kind of the mirror image of the thought experiment, you know? So imagine that the life you're experiencing right now is fake. You're, in fact, just, a vegetable lying comatose on a hospital bed and your brain is connected to a computer program and life, in fact, is much more miserable than you think it is right now, okay? So you're far happier now and this is all fake, okay? Would you rather be unplugged from the machine? Now, it turns out that many people say no, you know, this is fine <laughs> as it is, <laughs> okay? Um, so it, it's not so much I think that people are running away from fake and want truth, okay? I think people are just afraid of new things, so they want status quo. And this looks like real to me, you know? I mean, but that's how the Nozick machine would look like too, if you were plugged into it, right? And uh, people kind of find it difficult to relate to all those, okay? So the, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that um, the idea 
that asking for fake happiness is somehow not good and you need to be happy for the right reasons um, is, is not really a true reason why people don't ask the genie for happiness, okay? Um, all right, reason number 11. <clears throat> asking the genie for happiness means handing over the keys of my life to the genie, right? Who knows what the genie might do to me, okay? Um, this, so this is related to the idea of having control over your life, okay? And not wanting to have somebody else control your life. I'd rather be the author of my bad and stupid mistakes than somebody be responsible for my great decisions, okay? That kind of an idea. Um, so it, it kind of taps into this uh, desire for control that a lot of us have um, that is a very major internal obstacle to happiness, okay? And, and that's what the beauty of this genie question is to me is that it reveals a lot of the internal obstacles that we impose on ourselves. Okay, now it turns out that on a lot of, a lot of happiness research um, has found that giving up control is crucial for happiness. So the art of giving up is as important as the art of not giving up, okay? So knowing when to give up versus not is, is a very, very important skill. Um, for example, um, the group of people called satisficers are much happier than the group of people called maximizers. Maximizers desire a lot of control over the environment. Um, a really great example of a maximizer is my dad, you know? Uh, we went to Cancun one time, for example, and he looked out of the, the beautiful view out there, and uh, he just, he was happy for two seconds, you know, and then after that, he started looking at the shower and say, hey, there's a lot of mold out here, and, you know, we pick, picked up the phone, it wasn't working, and he was really pissed off, and then, you know, started shouting at everybody, okay? Um, uh, satisficers, on the other hand, will go into a situation and think to themselves, I'm going to enjoy myself here, okay? I'm going to enjoy myself, maximize my happiness, under the constraint of what's available, rather than trying to make happiness even more by changing things around all the time. Now, I'm not recommending that we be satisficers all the time. I think it's important to be a maximizer sometimes because maximizers are the ones who come up with inventions because they identify problems and ways in which things can be improved. But to be constantly stuck in the maximizer mindset is not good either, okay? You need to be able to straddle that, and there's an art to it, okay? Um, likewise, obsessive compulsive people are, are less happy. Um, obsessive compulsive people are wanting to be in control constantly, okay? Uh, how am I doing on time, by the way? Okay, yeah, that's good. Okay, so the, the final thing I want to uh, mention here, uh, it actually is very exciting new research that's coming out of neurobiology and um, evolutionary psychology. Uh, a lot of the brain stuff uh, is finding that um, free will, in fact, might be an illusion. Okay, so this might be one of those like mind-blowing kind of concepts um, that, that uh, gets a lot of press in the near future. But um, th there's a guy called, I, I won't get too much into it unless there's a lot of interest in it and you can ask me um, a question later on about this. But um, there's a guy called Benjamin Liebe who did a bunch of experiments in which uh, he asked people to kind of move, a, move their thumb. Okay, and he kind of had a dial, a kind of a clock in front of them and the clock kind of moved around. There was a red kind of dot that moved around the clock and he would ask them to indicate the point at which they made their decision to move the thumb, right? Um, now it turns out, let's say that the dot was at one when I decided, okay, I'm gonna move my thumb now. Um, it turns out that about 800 milliseconds before I knew that I'd made a decision, the experimenter could tell me I was gonna make a decision, okay? So our subconscious is making a decision first before we are aware of it, okay? And you don't even have to look at these experimental evidence. If you just think back logically, to all the decisions you make, right? Uh, and to what extent the I or the you had control over it. Um, you'll realize that you didn't decide where you were born. You didn't decide the color of your skin. You didn't decide your parents. You didn't decide your neighborhood, your upbringing, your, neighborhood, your, your friends. So a lot of the things that went in as input into who you are right now and the decisions you make were not in your control to begin with, right? And even the idea that you have free will is an idea that was put into your head. I can almost guarantee that had you been born in the Middle Ages in India, you would believe everything was destiny, okay? Uh, no one believed in free will at that point. Okay, <clears throat> um, reason number 12. Um, I can't be happy unless I have fill in the blanks. I think the lady out here, Cheryl, I think, if I'm reading your name right, um, it's kind of similar to this, uh, that you know, I know that I need to cross Philadelphia to reach New York, so why don't I ask for Philadelphia, right? Uh, in in the, the ticket example. Okay, a variant of it is, uh, I don't want to be happy unless I have 
X, Y, or Z, you know? Um, so one of the students with whom I had an exchange about this uh, said, you know, uh, I don't want to ask the genie for happiness because the genie might turn me into a village idiot, right? I might be one of those guys, like, do you guys know this uh, character called Leslie who died some time back in, in downtown Austin, right? He would kind of wear uh, dress and drag and, you know, he was a male but uh, dressed as a woman. Um, so, uh, you know, I might turn into that kind of a guy. You know, maybe he was very happy. I didn't know him personally, but let's assume that he was happy. Would you be him, rather be him, or be you? You know, the real me, miserable me, or the fake Leslie happy, right? Uh, most people say, no, I don't want to do that because uh, then I would lose, you know, people would stop respecting me. Um, I wouldn't be somebody that other people looked up to and so on, okay? Now, if it turns out that you can't be happy unless you're respected by other people, would not the genie know that? Right? The genie is all-powerful, all-knowing, right? And so the genie could not, by definition, make you happy uh, unless uh, it made you somebody who was self-respected, okay? But my student told me, but the genie might change that aspect of me, right? It might make me one of those people who um, don't, uh, doesn't want self-respect anymore. Self-respect is no longer a constraining condition for me to be happy, and so it might change my identity. Right? So there's two kinds of fears hidden in that response. So one of them is the fear of the genie. Right? There's a certain distrust. Um, I mentioned this uh, early on in this talk that when I ask the genie question, uh, I've run many variants of it. And one of the variants I, asked, I tell, tell the people making the wishes, uh, imagine that the genie is totally benign right? and doesn't have anything but your good interests at heart. Okay? Despite that, uh, people come up with this, this response of distrust. Okay, there's also a fear of losing identity. Right? A fear of uh, changing into somebody that I don't recognize anymore. Okay? There's interesting work by this guy called Jason Rees in uh, Harvard who looks at what kinds of pills are people willing to take. Right? Pills that change their moods, pills that change their intelligence levels, pills that change their um, ability to uh, interact with other people. Um, so it turns out the deeper and deeper the changes are to what people think are my kind of core part of my identity, the less willing people are to take those kinds of drugs, okay? So there's some fear that we're gonna change into something we don't even recognize, right? Um, that's underlying it. Now, there's this uh, economist at uh, Canada called uh, uh, James Helliwell who does work on trust. And it turns out trust is a very, very important aspect of happiness. In fact, if you look at country level happiness, the single biggest indicator of how happy a whole country is, is how the people respond to a question uh, on average, I can trust the people with whom I interact on a regular basis. Uh, if a lot of people strongly agree with that statement, that country is going to be happy. Okay, and it makes sense, right? If you can't even kind of relax when you're interacting with people, especially business relationships, then how happy are you going to be? You're, con you're going to be constantly vigilant. You're going to be insecure. You're going to be stressed out when you go to sleep. You're not going to be sure if things are going to work out, etc. Okay, so trust is very important. And that is, of course, true uh, when you look at you know, interpersonal trust with people, dealings with people. But I'm making the case that a general sense of trust about the universe is very important as well. If you think that you're in a good place, you're taken care of, you're generally going to be nurtured and treated well, and everything that happens to you is for the best, and everything is cooperating in order to make you the best you can be, if you have that attitude, then you're going to go into life and embrace everything that happens to you with a sense of trust and uh, a, a sense of uh, uh, peacefulness about it, okay? Emotional equanimity. On the other hand, if you think that life is a dangerous place, it's a doggy dog world out there, you know, everybody's looking out for themselves, I can't really trust people, I've got to be vigilant all the time, then that's going to erode into your sense of happiness. You're not going to have that same level of ease when you, when you operate. And the fact is, whether the universe is benign or malign, uh, there's no right answer to it, okay? Um, the mindset that you have, is going to be confirmed because of placebo effects. So if you go and operate in the world as if the world is a benign place, you're going to see evidence for it. If you're going to operate in the world as if it's a malign place, you're going to see evidence for it. If most smart people uh, think that the world is indifferent, you're going to see evidence for that as well, okay? So this is one of those things where scientifically there's no one right or one wrong answer, okay? The answer that, uh, the mindset that you adopt, in fact, will turn out to be the right one. Okay. Uh, and I think, uh, leaving science aside, being focused on this goal of happiness, um, it turns out that there's only one right answer, which is that you assume that the world is a benign place. If you can 
afford to do it, okay? All right, so let me spend a couple of minutes on the real reason why people don't ask the genie for happiness. So I call this the 13th monkey, and the reason I call it a monkey is because all the 12 reasons are monkeys on your back, okay? The more you get rid of, the more monkeys you get rid of, the more you're gonna free yourself into being happy, a happy person. Um, can anybody guess what the 13th reason is? Um, this, I think, is the real reason why people don't ask the genie for happiness. All the other reasons are all BS, you know? They just forgot to ask for happiness, and so they then come up with reasons for it. The 13th reason is it doesn't occur to people that they could have asked for happiness. Okay, and I, I, I know this because if I prompt people that they can ask for happiness too, right? Then suddenly, from about 5% to 45% of the people have happiness on their list. Okay, so merely mentioning, and this is what I was talking about earlier too, that this group seems to have asked for happiness, you know, two times as many people ask for happiness in this group. I think it's partly because uh, you know what you knew what the title was, right, of the talk and so on. Um, and this, though, is not a trivial reason. It points to uh, this fundamental happiness paradox, and the paradox is that people think happiness is very important. It's one of the most important goals, one of the desired states to be in, but they end up forgetting that. And therefore, they end up making decisions that don't maximize their happiness. They give up um, opportunities to maximize happiness. Okay, let me just quickly go through a couple of scenarios, okay? I'm gonna um, quickly read this, uh, or, or kind of paraphrase it. You know, imagine that you go into a salad bar where you pay by the pound. Uh, imagine that everybody's been to these kinds of situations. Um, and imagine that you really, really love a certain ingredient, let's say chickpeas. You love chickpeas, you hate grilled chicken, let's say, okay? Now, um, you know that you're gonna have to pay by the pound, and you know that grilled chicken is more expensive than chickpeas, right? So what are you gonna do, okay? Um, it turns out 100% of the people agree that from the point of view of maximizing your happiness, maximizing your enjoyment, you should put more chickpeas onto your plate than grilled chicken, okay? But in fact, only about 74% of the people actually do it. Okay, uh, so a good 24% are willing to sacrifice their happiness in order for enhancing value for money, okay? Um, here's another example, okay, happy or right? Uh, uh, I have to kind of uh, couch, uh, you know, uh, qualify this by saying that this actually did not happen in my family, although it might look like it did. Okay, um, supposing you're in a really satisfying romantic relationship, the only thing is that, let's say that your partner is a little bit overweight, you tell them, okay, do this, this X, Y, and Z, you know, it's gonna really work for you, they never do it, and then they come home running one day, very excited, saying, I just met this really handsome looking guy at the gym, and he told me to do X, Y, and Z, and I'm gonna start doing it from now on, you know? So do you say, pat her on the back and say, congratulations, that's great, you know, I'm happy that you're gonna do this, I, I think it's gonna really work, or are you gonna angrily point out to the person and say that, but that's the same thing that I told you, and you never listened to me, and now somebody, some other guy comes and tells you, and now you're all, like, excited, you know? Um, so from the perspective of maximizing happiness, it's a no-brainer, right? You eat your ego, you know? You can either be happy or right sometimes in, in relationships, right? Um, would you rather be happy or would you rather be, uh, well, it's not even right. It's just uh, would you rather boost your ego or massage your, uh, whatever, you know? So um, here again, uh, we, we found a similar pattern. I mean, uh, only about, I say only, but about 94% of the people thought that um, uh, congratulating the partner is the happiness maximizing way to go, but only about 68% were uh, able to bring themselves to do it, okay? Um, so I think it's because of this fundamental happiness paradox, we know that this is important, but in our day-to-day -day decision making, we forget it, and therefore we uh, decline opportunities to maximize our happiness, okay? And um, Having the clarity that happiness is important, both in the Gini question as well as in everyday decision making, is going to be a very important uh, thing to do if you want to be happy. And I think this is a very basic internal obstacle. Before we talk about all the other recommendations, you know, spend money wisely, socialize, you know, set your priorities right or whatever, recognizing that there are internal obstacles that are stopping you from being happy, that are caging you in, you know, um, is, is the first step, I feel, okay? Now, why does the fundamental happiness paradox exist? Um, there's a very deep set of reasons that I want to talk about in the book. I'll very briefly mention it here. I think we're conditioned by society to follow certain rules of living, rules of living, I call them. Um, so we pay a lot of attention to being important, um, 
fame, money, power, et cetera, we lose sight of what's intrinsically motiva motivating, what's absorbing to us. Um, so we chase the things that are mediums to happiness rather than happiness itself. Um, we uh, want to be loved and attended to. Rarely do we focus on loving other people and being compassionate. Now, that's one of the world's best kept secrets, I feel. You know, when you love other people, when you're outwardly focused, chances are you're more likely to be happy. Uh, we have a very great desire for external control, controlling other people, changing other people. Um, if we take the responsibility to change ourselves internally and take personal responsibility for our own emotional state of happiness, regardless of what happens outside of me, I know I can interpret it in such a way that maximizes my, or minimizes my uh, negativity, maximizes my positivity. Taking that personal responsibility is important. Uh, and finally, this is uh, something that happens only among human, humans, I think, uh, especially smart people. There's a very heavy desire for clarity on issues, you know, um, especially when it comes to really uh, complicated issues, such as, you know, is um, pro-life or pro-choice uh, the, the right way to think about things. You know, you would think that for simple issues, you should have a lot of confidence. And people do have a lot of confidence. There's overconfidence almost on any issue. But overconfidence is particularly pronounced for really complex issues, OK? People know exactly what's the right thing when it comes to questions like, is there a god or not, OK? And what that god is, uh, whether pro-choice or pro-life is good, and so on, OK? The more complex an issue gets, the more confident people get, OK? So it's because of the desire for clarity. And I think that if you give up that desire and acknowledge that some things are complicated, maybe for some things there's no answers, you know? So what, right? Being comfortable with that ambiguity is going to be very important. And I think that ambiguity will, will lead to learning. And so focusing on the learning and uh, not getting uh, too wedded to the idea of I need to be clear on issues, uh, I think is a very important step as well. OK, <clears throat> okay so uh, this is my last slide. Um, so uh, I just want to quickly talk about um, w what the implications are. Um, so to me, it seems like a lot of the biggest obstacles to happiness are internal. Um, of course, it, external cooperation is important. Until you reach a certain level of success, until you've sampled a certain level of fame, a certain level of wealth, um, you can continue to believe that maybe if I got more of those, I'm going to be happier, right? So this message is not for the poor farmer in India, for example, who thinks that you know, driving a Mercedes or whatever is going to make them happy. They've never had the opportunity to test drive that hypothesis, right? Uh, but we have, and we know that it hasn't made us as happy as we thought it was going to make us. You know, we continue to be more miserable, less happy than we wanted to be. And uh, for us, I think it's important to take that uh, perspective that I'm going to take that responsibility on myself to be the giving person, to be the larger person. Um, and uh, to me, I mean, the idea that, you know, to think that this is going to be solvable easily or that, you know, I'm going to arrive at this... Uh, recommendation, and then all I have to do is kind of apply this algorithm, and it's going to work out. Uh, at least for me, it's not been the case. You know, it's been a lifelong journey, and the more I've made peace with the idea that I'll never arrive at a answer, and the answer might change, keep changing, but there are some basics uh, that seem to point me in the right direction. I think it's going to be important as well. I think what you will find, as I have found, uh, if you're similar to me, is that a very important aspect is changing the rules of living. Um, I, I talked very briefly about it, happy to elaborate on it. And uh, I think entertaining spiritual ideas is going to be a very important thing as well. Especially for a lot of smart people, uh, they get wedded to the idea that, you know, there's a certain right way to look at things, certain wrong way to look at things. And we tend to have a disparaging, derogatory kind of attitude towards people who are religious, you know. Uh, and I think that that's, that's a mistake. Um, because to be open-minded to all approaches, uh, is going to be a very critical aspect of it. And entertaining ideas such as the universe in which we live is a benign one. And entertaining ideas such as maybe there's a state of being where the mind is no longer involved. Um, you go transcend the space of the mind into a space of no mind. Uh, entertaining these ideas, I think, is going to be a very important thing. Okay? Thank you very much. Questions? Yes. So um, let me see if I can bring this up again. Uh, how do I? Yeah, she, so she said, what do you mean by changing the rules of living? Oops. Gosh, I got to go all the way. 
Okay, so um, I had a slide up there which talked about four rules by which I think we currently live. Um, and these are rules that I think society propagates quite a bit, implicitly and explicitly, and they have a genetic basis to them, you know? And so I don't want to call them shallow rules. I think they are deep-rooted, um, but they're unfortunate in the sense that they not only erode into our happiness, they also erode into societal happiness. And those rules are that the more important I am, um, the more uh, I have arrived, you know? So the need for importance uh, manifested in being wealthy, being powerful, being rich, being in control, being respected, being accomplished, being beautiful. Second rule is that the more I'm loved, okay, the uh, desire for love is, is a valid and important kind of need. Um, third rule is uh, need for control, okay, over other people, over the environment. Okay, my happiness, I'm not as happy as I can be because others are not doing what they ought to be doing, okay? If only everybody else changed, then I'd be happy, okay? Think about how weird, I mean, stupid, in fact, I mean, sorry, but it's stupid, you know? Because you can maybe change one person, you know, at one point in time, okay? How many people are you going to change? You know, once you change that person, then you, your attention is going to be on other people who now you need to change in order to, for you to be happy. It's a never-ending process. Okay, much better to take internal, you know, uh, responsibility to change oneself internally. And the fourth is the need for clarity um, on, on every issue. Um, and uh, I, I think that giving up that need for clarity is going to be important on certain issues uh, and not force yourself to believe that you've achieved clarity when that clarity is not there. So all, all these four rules, I think, are emphasized a lot. And I can talk about how this happens from a very young age. You know, I've observed my child in the daycare and so on. And these are all, a lot of times, well-intentioned people who are uh, subtly kind of steering people towards um, a position where these needs become very salient to them. And I'm proposing that the, we replace these four with an alternative set of rules, uh, replace need for importance with a need for absorption. So the idea is, I mean, similar to flow. We derive a lot of meaning and satisfaction out of being so immersed in an activity that we lose track of time, you know? Uh, all of us have had that experience, you know? But it's rarely ever praised or, or emphasized in life, you know? We never tell people, you know, lose yourself in an activity, and that's what you've got to aim for. Rather, we say, which job is going to pay you the highest? Are you going to be successful? Is, you, is it going to be New York City? Oh, wow, you know? We never say, tell people, our kids or, or students, you know, do something that really you're very, very passionate about. The fame and everything will come as byproducts. You know, don't worry about that, okay? Um, need to love instead of need to be loved. And here, I think, you know, one of the big uh, determinants of happiness uh, it has been found in a lot of research is the story you tell yourself. You know, when you're seeking others to love you as opposed to loving other people and being compassionate, the story you're telling yourself is, I'm incomplete, I need other people to give me, fill in my bucket, right? Whereas when you love other people, when you're not worried about your own situation, when you're there to serve other people, the story you're telling yourself is, I'm a king, you know, I'm a queen or whatever. You know, I'm big, I'm generous, I'm big hearted, I'm here to give. It's a very powerful story you tell yourself, you know? Um, so I think it's a very important reason why that, that makes you happier. Uh, need for external and internal control, I already talked a little bit about it, and the need for giving up on clarity and focusing instead on learning, I think is also important. So that's what I mean by the changing the rules of living. Yes? <laughs> yeah, you're, you're French? <laughs> no, we're not French. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> so, uh, a true thinking person would, you know, be concerned about all the problems weighing the world, and why wouldn't you be happy when there's so much misery out there? So, right. I think different cultures have different views, and I was wondering if that's something. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so her question is different cultures view happiness differently, and from her culture, being happy is equated to being stupid because uh, there's so much misery in this world that only a stupid person would be happy despite all the misery, right? Am I paraphrasing you correctly? Um, so, uh, so I've done some uh, little kind of vignette studies informally with people. Uh, maybe I should do it a little more formally, but I give them two scenarios, right? In both scenarios, uh, it describes a person who's accomplished exactly the same, and it's a pretty impressive set of accomplishments. But in one scenario, the person had to struggle a lot to get there, and internally fragmented, miserable, et cetera, uh, in order to get there. Another person happily waltzes their way to success, right? Which would you pick? 
Okay? It turns out <laughs> you would think that everybody should pick the second option, you know? I mean, they're happy and they accomplish the same thing, but it turns out, at least in the kind of informal things, it's, it seems like it's not so simple. It seems like we have a desire to suffer in accomplishing things. And maybe Russians are particularly strong in this desire or whatever. And, uh, you know, if you're aware of something called BEM's self-perception theory, it kind of makes sense. Our value for things is not fixed. Okay, our value is inferred based on the amount of effort we had to put to get it. Okay, and the more we struggle towards something, it seems like it was more worthwhile. Okay, and so you've got to be cautious about why it is that you desire this misery in the first place. Is it to tell yourself that this is more valuable? If that is the case, then, you know, it seems like an un unworthy exercise, at least in my view. Okay, you want to achieve something, why not be happy when you're achieving it? Okay, in other words, another way to put it is, is your denying yourself the happiness because there's so much misery, in fact, attenuating the misery, or is it adding to it, okay? If it's adding to it, then by definition, you're not helping solve that problem, which is uh, the reason why you wanted to be miserable in the first place, right? You'd rather be happy and solve the problem than be miserable and not solve it, right? Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much, appreciate it.